Hey, I'm Matt Diefenderfer. Welcome back to our series talking about different uh, tools for MRI pre-processing, processing, and general analysis. Today, we're going to be doing something slightly different. We're going to be talking about uh, quality control. So before you get into pre-processing and processing, you need to make sure that the data that you have is actually worth looking at in the first place. Uh, now, during the scan, whenever you're acquiring the data, you should be looking at the uh, images and doing ratings on them to make sure that you don't need to reacquire them. But looking straight at the raw data can lead to a little bit of bias in terms of uh, how humans actually grade the scans. So what we're going to look at today is MRI QC, it stands for MRI Quality Control. So it is a toolbox that extracts various image quality metrics from your raw data gives you something um, absolute, discrete, and uh, objective to look at to grade whether your scans are of sufficient quality to move forward or whether you need to reacquire or exclude them from the analysis. So MRI QC was developed by Russ Poldrack at his lab at Stanford University and is currently maintained as part of the NI Preps uh, sort of like toolbox suite. Um, and so you can download it. It is hosted uh, or it is available as a um, Docker container. Uh, in our case, since we're going to be using it on Chiha, we're going to be using it as a singularity container. And I'll show you how to look at that here in a little bit. But what it does is it takes bids formatted data and it runs through the unprocessed data, extracts the uh, general information about things like movement uh, and general noise and presents them to you in nice uh, uh, HTML file formats um, for you to actually look at. It shows you a bunch of pictures and everything. We'll see that here in a little bit. So if you wanted to use MRI QC on Chiha, how would you go about it? Well, we have a, um, <clears throat> we have a page on how to use MRI QC at our documentation at uab-cinl.github.io. If you go down to the MRI pre-processing and analysis section, you can click on MRI QC. Uh, like I said, MRI QC is hosted as a sing or as a Docker container on Docker Hub, but we're going to download it using Singularity. Uh, luckily, it is very easy to download. Uh, all you need to do is get a interactive session on Chiha and uh, bring up a terminal. Use module load Singularity to load up the Singularity capabilities and then run singularity pull and then it'll you're going to give it the name of the uh, image file that you're wanting to create so in our case we're just saying mriqc-0161.sif uh, that's going to be the version number this is the most recently like stable version that i've gotten to run uh, consistently and then you're going to give it the path to the Docker image. In our case, it's going to be docker colon slash slash poldrack lab slash MRIQC colon and then 0 0.16.1, which is the version number. So this process will take a while to run, but once it's run and finished, uh, you don't need to download the image ever again. It'll just be there for you to use whenever you need it. So you can put it in your project space, in your lab's project space, and everybody will have access to it. Uh, from there, Using it is pretty simple. The uh, inputs for it, all you need to do is you run it as the singularity image file. So you do singularity run and then the path to the image file. Uh, there are a number of optional inputs we'll talk about here in a little bit, but the basic inputs are the path to the overall bids directory. So the bids formatted directory, the output directory where all of the reports are gonna be held, and then the analysis level, which is either gonna be participant level or group level. So if we look at an actual script that we have or that I've run previously, so I've got an MRI QC single subject script and a group uh, script. So let's look at the single subject script. So we've got that basic command, like we've, uh, like I said previously, uh, the path to the bids formatted directory, and then the path to the uh, output directory. In our case, uh, I'm putting it in the derivatives slash MRI QC directory here. And then we're doing it at a single participant level, at a single subject level. So since we're doing it at a participant level, I'm gonna give it a uh, list of participants that we actually wanna run it on. So in our case, the participant levels are gonna be S01 and S02, just two participants that I have laying around that I wanna run this on. 
And then I'm giving it the number of CPUs and the amount of memory that I've requested for the job up here. Uh, in my case, these parameters have worked the best for me so far um, with one CPU and 40 gigs of RAM. Uh, six hours, it won't take six hours for the job to run, but it gives it enough time to complete uh, pretty handily. So after we run that, if we go and look at the outputs, so we're in our nifty derivatives folder, MRIQC, and it outputs a series of scans for each structural scan and functional scan. So for our participants, we have one T1 weighted image and two functional images. So we have an individual HTML file for each of those. So if we look at the T1 weighted image, the top of the file is gonna have some pretty basic information. So the bids file name, the date and time that MRIQC was run, as well as the MRIQC version number. And then you're gonna have a rating widget over here where you can rate this image overall as either completely excluded from everything moving forward, you can rate it as poor, as acceptable, or as excellent. And then you have a list of common artifacts that people see or have seen in other data. And as you're looking through, you can check these, say if there's head motion artifact, you can check it here and it'll hold that information for people to look at later on. For now, we're just gonna go ahead and move this image rating widget and just look through what we've got. So the majority of the reports are gonna be visual reports. In our case, these are gonna be zoomed in brain masks for the T1 weighted image in a horizontal view. And as we're, it gives you a pretty large number of slices to look at. And as we're looking through, this scan looks very good overall. There's a very high contrast between the white matter and the gray matter. It doesn't look like there's any sort of ringing artifacts or anything like that. Uh, overall, a very high quality T1 image. It also gives you a few uh, sagittal images to look at. Um, not as many as the horizontal, but uh, both of these together gives you a good idea of just the general quality of the scan. As well, Another visual output is going to be background noise. So uh, you can scroll through and see that uh, yellow and green are going to be areas of high background noise, whereas areas of dark purple is going to be are going to be areas of low background noise. And what you want, so if you look through, you can see that the te things like the teeth and the sinus cavities and uh, like ear canals and things like that. Um, I don't know if those are ear canals, but those are. In fact, I'm pretty sure they're not, but uh, various anatomical features are going to have high background noise, but whenever you get into the brain itself, uh, you don't really want to see any noise whatsoever. You want this to be pretty much all purple. And that's what we see for this subject here. You can see the outline of the front of the brain next to uh, some of the sinuses up here, uh, next to some of the, yeah, next to some of the sinuses up at the front. Um, uh, areas of high noise, but the brain itself is very low noise overall. So that's really good. Uh, same thing for the sagittal views over here, uh, areas of the brain itself is very low noise. Everything else can be high noise. It doesn't matter. Uh, but the brain itself is low noise, which is great. And then you can also click on this extracted image quality metrics. So these give you single numerical values for a variety of metrics that tell you the quality of the image. Uh, all of these are given as abbreviations and it's okay if you don't know what the abbreviations are. We're gonna see we're gonna show you how you can find out what they mean here in just a little bit. So these give you the actual values to look at and if you know the value what they values and what they mean offhand and what's good and bad then you can just tell hey it's good or bad just offhand. But uh, same, if we look at the bold images, uh, we get the same sort of thing. So we open up the bold report, has the same sort of uh, rating widget over here that you can use to mark it as whatever you want. Um, the same thing with the workflow details, bids, name, date, time, MRIQC version, so on and so forth. And then for the visual reports, it gives you the bold average. So it's averaging all of the volumes together and presenting them as uh, very, as the slices through that average. Uh, and just remember, as you're looking at this bold image, uh, these images are not pre-processed. So there's been no distortion correction on them. So for this AP image, as you're looking at the front here and you see this weird smushing at the front and 
uh, extension at the back. This is an AP image, so that's completely normal. Uh, you shouldn't uh, mark an image as being bad for having that since they are uncorrected as of now. So you can look through here. Uh, in the main area of the brain, uh, you can see pretty high contrast between white matter, gray matter, and overall, there there is a little bit of like, uh, there is a tiny bit of motion artifact that you can see through some of the ringing at the front. Uh, but in most of these slices, everything looks pretty good overall. Uh, as well, it also gives you a standard deviation map. So uh, what is the spread of the values of all of the voxels uh, over the entire time course? You can see that whenever you are looking at the standard deviation of voxels corresponding to the eyes, uh, these have high standard deviation because eyes are pretty constantly moving. So the values in those voxels are going to be uh, are going to have pretty high, uh, pretty high spread. But Whenever you get into the actual brain, what you want are low standard deviation values. You want you don't want a uh, large spread of values within these voxels. You can see within these within this scan, uh, the brain itself is pretty low standard deviation. Uh, you do get areas of high standard deviation along the edges of the brain, and then at some of the major blood vessels that go through the brain. Um, blood vessels just because a blood is flowing through them. Uh, it's going to give you different value, like pretty distinct different values. And then at the edge of the brain, there might be slight movement causing these voxels to have uh, brain or um, CSF or skull or empty space, depending on how much movement there is. Uh, there could be those tissue types uh, in that voxel at any given point in the uh, in each of the volumes. So. What you want is this low uh, low standard deviation across the entire brain, whereas some ha high standard deviation across the edges is fine for the most part. But we can also see this using some of these graphs that they've got. So they have slice-wise noise, noise, noise average on the background. Uh, they also have DVARs. And then uh, the one that I use is uh, frame-wise displacement. So uh, it's just the absolute distance um, after motion correction that the brain moved from the beginning reference image. And then they've also put in a nice line of 0.2 millimeter cutoff so that you can get a decent idea of how many volumes were, went beyond this cutoff point. So in our case, there might be like 15 to 20 volumes that had a frame-wise displacement greater than 0.2. And out of 420 volumes, that seems like a pretty reasonable, um, a pretty reasonable percentage, especially because 0.2 millimeters is a pretty stringent cutoff for frame-wise displacement. Uh, just to be clear, though, no actual motion correction is like saved to your data. Um, all your data is just gonna is still gonna be raw data at the end. Uh, so you'll still need to perform motion correction, and no volumes are like uh, scrubbed from the data if they pass this uh, 0.2 millimeter threshold or anything. This is just purely information for you to see how many images there might have been that went to or past this uh, cutoff point. As well, it gives you it gives you a carpet plot so that you can see uh, if there were any large scale artifacts at uh, various moments in time. This one looks pretty good overall, uh, but uh, if there are some pretty uh, noticeable artifacts, you'll be able to see them in the carpet plot generally as well. Likewise, uh, uh, to the structural image, there are image quality metrics that are extracted from the functional images as well. So things like mean frame-wise displacement, in our case, this scan had a mean frame-wise displacement across all of its volumes of 0.13, uh, 0.137. So that's pretty good. Over, that's pretty good. Like, I would say that's a pretty high quality bold scan. Uh, so you can do the single subject, uh, the single subject outputs. You can look at those. Those give you a good idea of the quality of the scans, and you should look through all of them and mark them. Um, but you can also run a group analysis after the participant level that takes all of the individual image quality metrics and aggregates them together into single plots. So if we take a look at what the script looks like for this, um, it looks pretty much exactly the same, ex uh, except we've switched this from participant to group, and we've taken out 
the participant labels. Uh, what it's gonna do is it's gonna go to this output directory that you've named with all of the participant, lo uh, participant level outputs. And it's just gonna grab all of those outputs that it sees and aggregate them together. So you don't need to give it a list of participants or anything like that. So if we look at what the outputs of those are, if we look at the uh, output bold, group bold, it is going to have a data point for each bold scan that it finds. In our case, we have two bold scans per subject and two subjects. So we have four data points. Uh, and it gives you a list of all of the image quality metrics that it has data on and then plots those points on these plots. Uh, and like I said before, all of these are in, ag are in acronym format. So if you don't know what they stand for, one nice thing about it is that you can click on EFC here, and it'll take you to what it stands for, Entry, uh, Entropy Focus Criterion. If you clicked on EFC there, it takes you to the function that's used to calculate it, and uh, it'll give you a brief explanation with the mathematical formula, as well as a link to the paper that they got the thing from. If you go back, you can do the same thing for things like DVARs, uh, and it'll give you a nice explanation of what DVARs ref uh, refers to, as well as the paper that it comes from. So I would read through these, and these are all on the MRIQC uh, docs. So if you went back to the docs here and clicked on image quality metrics, you can do it for both functional image and structural images. Uh, you can read through all the metrics here as well, but if you just need a quick reference to what one of them is, then you can click on the name in the group output, for, uh, group output file. As well, if you're looking through the data and you see one that's an extreme outlier, in our case, since we only have four data points, it's hard to find an extreme outlier, but say this one right here was an extreme outlier uh, whenever you had data for a huge number of subjects available. You can click on this data point here. So first of all, it comes up with the name of the uh, scan that, it com that, the, that the number comes from, but you can then click on that data point and it'll take you to the uh, HTML file that that data point comes from. So if this was a uh, an outlier in terms of DVARs, then you could read through this uh, file here and figure out what might be wrong or just look at it for, uh, further, uh, for further analysis. Uh, so from there, so what I would suggest you do is to run all of the participant level MRIQC first, and then also create the group level metrics at the same time. And then the group level metrics can, or the group level plots can help you see which ones are extreme outliers first. And so that you can quickly go and look at those and determine whether you need to recollect that data uh, as soon as possible or whatever. And then from there, after you deal with any outliers that you find, you should go through each of the individual HTML files and rate them and have that as information for later on down the line if you're publishing the data or sharing it with anybody else or just sharing it within the lab. All right, so that's really about it as far as the uh, outputs for MRIQC go. Uh, if you have questions on how to use MRIQC, so like I said before, we have our page at uab-cinl.github.io for you to look at with a number of other positional arguments for you to look at. You can go to their uh, MRIQC page. I would definitely suggest you read through it. It's a very good explanation for uh, how they actually, but they're, what tools they're using to calculate these metrics. And then we also have a um, office hours for research computing on Mondays and Thursdays from 10 to 12 on Zoom that you can feel free to come and ask any questions to me about if you can't get it running on Chiha or anything like that. So um, with that, I think that's about it. Uh, if you have any questions, you can type in the uh, comments, feel free to email me, feel free to come to office hours. Um, and yeah, look forward to doing another one soon.